heads clean off, you know? Yeah. And then just skin them. So, yeah. Hey. Sorry, we were talking about how to brutally murder Barbie dolls. So, we're going to get into this video. Oh, don't mind that painful burp. This is the eggnog riot. Christmas chaos at West Point. U.S. Military Academy, West Point. And they had... They had an eggnog issue, huh? Eggnog's... Del who is it? Dave... Oh my goodness. Forgot his name. Anyways, he said the best thing about eggnog is it's... Uh, when you drink eggnog, it's like drinking uh, delicious pancake batter. <laughs> I don't even remember who. I cannot think of who was it said that now. I, I mean, I, I can see his face. Oh, that's going to drive me crazy. Okay, let's get into the video. Next point. New York, 1826. Twas the night before Christmas, about second watch, when cadets were preparing for a festive debauch. They stirred up some yolks, cream, and cinnamon roots, and produced hidden booze from footlockers and boots. They whipped at the mixture to thicken the nog, then <laughs> dipped in three gallons of moonshine and grog. They oh, wow. toasted the season while keeping things quiet, and 11 toasts later, <clears throat> came the great eggnog riot. Three gallons of moonshine? <laughs> How big was this container to begin with? It's a lot of booze. Thanks so much to Tab for a Cause for supporting great charities. Find out how you can help for free after the episode. Mmm, eggnog. A beloved holiday beverage. Creamy and sweet. Kind of like a knit sweater in drink form, you know? Essentially harmless. Unless you were drinking it in 19th century America when it would get you totally trashed. Back then, eggnog incorporated all that was cheap and plentiful in the early American Republic. Eggs and milk from dairy farms, sugar from the Caribbean triangle trade, and who could forget, huge amounts of alcohol. George Washington went hard with his own recipe, calling for a pint of brandy, a half pint of rum, a half pint of rye whiskey, and a quarter pint of sherry. Wow. Uh, but with this mixture, he led his guests in giving toast after toast after toast after toast, draining the glass each time. Yeah, turned out getting blitzed at the holidays was kind of an American custom. Which is why, in 1826, dozens of West Point cadets defied the orders of Superintendent Sylvanus Thayer and brewed up a batch of boozy eggnog on their own. Now, Thayer ran West Point on a strict disciplinary regime. Actually, he'd been brought in for that purpose, appointed in 1817 to reform the then-failing institution. He introduced a regimented schedule, physical exercise, a new focus on engineering, a four-year curriculum, and a series of demerits. Basically, anything you imagine when you hear the words West Point. And that also included a strict code of conduct, which forbid cadets from purchasing, possessing, and drinking alcohol. At first, Thayer made exceptions for holidays. Cadets could drink on the 4th of July and Christmas. But Independence Day 1825 had turned into a drunken embarrassment, with cadets performing a snake dance and carrying Major William Worth, the popular commandant of cadets, back to their barracks. An unacceptable loss of military bearing. So now, Thayer had banned alcohol totally, and for the Christmas of 1826, the eggnog would be served bone dry. Yet Thayer still worried that someone, somewhere, was having a good time. That's why, at his personal Christmas party on December 23rd, 1826, Thayer pulls Major Worth aside into a quiet corner to discuss rumors he's heard that cadets are smuggling in alcohol. And he even has a chief suspect. Oh, we did it. We blocked the sound. Okay. Back to the video. He even has a chief suspect, Cadet Jefferson Davis. <laughs> yup, that Jefferson Davis. As in later president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis. Turns out Davis is- Um, I've been to his grave if, uh, yeah. And I went to the White House of the South where that was the Confederate White House. 
toured that. And uh, he's buried at Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia, with his wife and his kids. And that same cemetery holds James Monroe, the fifth president, John Tyler, the tenth president. Uh, right near each other, President Circle, it's called. <clears throat> um, general George Pickett, uh, Confederate general, uh, famous for Gettysburg, for Pickett's Charge, Day 3. Yeah. Just, uh, since I brought up Jefferson Davis, I thought I'd just mention it. I didn't bring it up. They did. Sorry. The worst drunk at the school? Notorious for sneaking out to taverns. In fact, he'd just gotten out of the hospital after an incident where he'd been stumbling back in the dark and fallen down a 60-foot ravine. Needless to say, Davis was a bad influence. A rebel. Though not like that teacher's pet Robert E. Lee, of course, who showed up at Thayer's office at 7 a.m. that morning to discuss trigonometry homework. Regardless, Thayer tells Worth that instructors staying in the barracks, Captain Hitchcock and Lieutenant Thornton, should definitely keep on the lookout. <clears throat> and boy was he right to be concerned, for even as Thayer spoke, a batch of contraband eggnog was already brewing in the North Barracks. For weeks, cadets had been felching ingredients and food from the mess hall, and sure enough, Jefferson Davis was one of the instigators. The most intrepid of which had ventured out to barter for alcohol at nearby taverns, but finding the prices too expensive for the sheer quantity they needed. Four cadets had crossed the Hudson River, where prices were cheaper. They finally settled on two gallons of cheap, barely-aged moonshine whiskey. But they ran into trouble on the way back, when they found a U.S. Army private guarding the West Point dock. So, whispering amongst themselves, they made a plan, scrapping together all of the money they had left for a bribe. 35 cents, which worked. Man, Zoe, corruption used to be so affordable. <sighs> Frickin' inflation. So back at the barracks, they poured the whiskey into the mix, along with a gallon of rum from another cadet. This was their act of resistance, a statement proving that Thayer couldn't take away their boozy, deeply unhealthy traditions. Oh yes, tomorrow they would toast and get toasted. Christmas Eve, the North Barracks, 11.59 p.m. All is quiet when Captain Hitchcock makes his final night patrol. Hmm, seems like Thayer's worries were unfounded. Whatever's happening, at least it's staying quiet. He and Thornton go to bed. But in room 28, the holiday nog bar is open, baby! Cadets are stealthing in to get their drink, then spilling into the nearby room to toast. But the party has been going on for hours, and the mix is getting a little thin. That is until a Christmas miracle. When a cadet returns from a midnight run with another gallon of whiskey. <laughs> hey, wait, did I say miracle? I, uh, I meant catastrophe, because this is where things start to go downhill. At 4 a.m. Christmas morning, Hitchcock awakes to such a clatter that he sprang from his bed to see what was the matter, which was, of course, two floors above him, a ton of singing, stomping, and shouting, you know, just full-on revelry. He crashes the party and finds six cadets in a single room and he's halfway through ordering them all back to their beds when he hears another commotion next door. And what Hitchcock finds in that room is both pathetic and hilarious. Three cadets completely blitzed. Two cower under a blanket, while another tries to, and I kid you not, hide his identity by putting a hat over his face, which works exactly as well as you'd expect it would. Oh Hitchcock God. berates them, ordering them back to their rooms. But the mood among the cadets starts to turn here a little. They're not cowed, they're angry. I mean, how dare he try to stop their deep-seated and wholesome tradition of celebrating the Messiah's birth by getting utterly annihilated on cream drinks laced with cheap rot gut, huh? And just as things start heating up, Hitchcock hears another roar downstairs and heads for the stairwell. Upon his exit, a cadet then makes a drunken decree. Get your dirks and bayonets and pistols if you got them. Before the night's over, Hitchcock will be dead. Meanwhile, okay. on the ground floor, Hitchcock bursts into room five. And it's crammed with cadets, more than the upstairs party. They all go still and turn to him. Then, with just the most impeccable timing, the opposite door slams open, and Jefferson Davis staggers in completely faced and shouts, You should put away the grog, boys! Captain Hitchcock is coming! He then presumably adds a, Oh. 
Hitchcock reads the cadets the riot act, legally informing them they must disperse. He then specifically orders Davis to go back to his room and stay there. Davis does and passes out in bed, thereby missing the rest of the festivities as the building descends into chaos. Dozens of drunk, belligerent cadets seize weapons. Then when Hitchcock comes across a locked room, he kicks down the door only to find himself looking down the barrel of a pistol. The powder jets in his face, but another cadet has slammed into the first cadet holding the gun, knocking off his aim. The bullet then explodes in the doorframe next to Hitchcock's head. Lu I didn't think anyone was actually going to pull the trigger. I just figured they're all drunk. Point blank range. I mean, I, 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 I mean this is humorous, but I hope that person was executed. You can't do that. Lieutenant Thornton, now awake, was doing no better. He tried to gain control of one group, only to be menaced with a sword. And then when he turned down a stairwell, another cadet knocked him out cold with a piece of wood. Hitchcock ran to a cadet on guard duty and told him to get the Commandant Major Worth. He was popular with the cadets and they might listen to him. Only here's where things get really twisted, because some of the rioting cadets misheard what Hitchcock said and thought that he'd called for regular artillery soldiers that were stationed at West Point. The generally upper-class cadets hated those lowly rank-and-file soldiers, and now what, Hitchcock wanted them to come and shell the barracks or something? Just no, absolutely not. No, no. The sloshed youths broke out their weapons in full and started fortifying the building. They besieged Hitchcock in his room, throwing stones and pieces of wood at his windows, and they broke... Oh my goodness. I thought this was going to be cute and funny and humorous. This is an all-out riot. <laughs> this is exactly what it says. I just didn't think it was going to be. They broke everything. They tore banisters off the stairs, shattered windows, and smashed all of the cookery. By the time Major Worth arrived just before 6 a.m., the eggnog was beginning to wear off. And when he called for morning formation, the mutineers actually staggered out sheepish and ill making a ragged line under the cruel Christmas dawn. 90 cadets, one third of the student body, took part in the eggnog riot. But since expelling a third of the school would have been a major embarrassment, they decided to only court-martial the 20 worst offenders. Since he'd gone to bed, Jefferson Davis escaped charges and was instead confined to barracks for six weeks, meaning that despite helping instigate the party, he largely dodged consequences. And Robert E. Lee, who had not participated, testified on behalf of the accused cadets, using his reputation as an honorable gentleman to launder his comrades' actions. This would, to put it lightly, become a reoccurring theme in both of their lives. Ultimately, nine cadets were permanently expelled. Their careers ruined so badly that two of them later became Confederate generals and won the Texas Secretary of State. Though another disgraced candidate spent most of his life entangled with the legal system, eventually serving eight years as a justice on the Supreme Court. Oh man, Zoe, for a second I was worried someone was going to learn something and there was going to be accountability, but thank you so much for keeping the status quo. USA! USA! Mm, hold on. Mm, this is strong. <clears throat> Actually, though, perhaps one thing was learned. Because these days, things happen a little bit different at West Point, as they send their cadets home for the holidays. So, if they happen to, say, get drunk and smash all the dishes, you know what? At least it's at their own family's house. Wow, Rob, that was a phenomenal story. Thank you for penning the script. David, thank you so much for illustrating this episode. Also, thank you so much to uh, Mac, our audio editor, and the boys over at Devon House Creative who put together the edit. Uh, and you know what? Actually, this, this brings me to a larger point. Uh, I've been drinking eggnog the entire time I've been reading this script, and uh, it has gotten me a little emotional. It is the holidays after all, and I'm the showrunner, and I can do what I want. So, uh, I would like to propose a toast. I would like to cheers to everyone who works with us uh, at Extra Credits. You are all wonderful beans, and these shows are ultimate. I'm going to go ahead and stop it here because it doesn't seem like it's going to go any further with the story. I think he's just thanking everyone. Maybe. I am an animal lover. I know. Shocking. And particularly around this time of the year. Okay. So, yeah, that was the eggnog riot. It's crazy. Jefferson, da Jefferson Davis starts it, and he gets out of it. Yeah. Funny story, and I think I've, I'm sure I've told this before. Um, Jefferson Davis served under Zachary Taylor 
in the War of 1812. No. There's the Black Hawk War. No? I don't remember now. I don't think it was the Mexican. It, it might have been the. Mm -mm. It was. It was before then. Anyways, he fell in love with Zachary Taylor's daughter. He wanted to marry her. And Zachary Taylor. He was Zachary Taylor's number two. And Taylor said nope, and made Jefferson Davis didn't make him, but Jefferson Davis resigned from the military before he was allowed to have permission to marry uh, Zachary Taylor's daughter. And then they moved to Louisiana or Mississippi. And both of them, Jefferson Davis and the wife, came down sick. And she ended up dying. They weren't married very long. And from there he became a politician. And then met his wife. And then, I think he was Secretary of War at one point, but yeah, there's another story I could tell, but it's better to, to not tell that one yet, because you would know the ending. It's a good cliffhanger. Okay, you I would tell you, but you would already kind of know the story idea, so I'm not going to tell you. I'll tell you in another video. So I'm going to end this here. Like and subscribe. Thanks for the eggnog riot. What a name. And uh, have a good day. Have a good night.